So I'll let you continue to write questions, but I just want to take a look over here and see what we found. So we have a lot of people who were adopted very early, which is good. And my approach is that even if they were adopted straight out of the delivery room, that still is a trauma. Is everybody kind of on board with that concept? So, yeah. They had nine months in a particular environment that was their entire world, and then it was gone. So it's not saying anything about the, the adoptive parents. You know, you, they came into loving arms. But out in the world, they don't understand how challenging that was. Right? So, and then we are kind of a, a lot of different ages. 5 to 10 and 13 to 17 seem to be, well, we have a lot of older ones now, too. Hopefully they've, uh, they've gotten to a good place. <laughs> Let's see more about that. How one child gets a lot of marks here. God, husband, sons, prayer. Yes, being consistent. So, deep breaths. Yeah, therapy, music, running, exercise. So, community of friends, extended family. So it's good, because sometimes family can be part of challenge, and sometimes they can be part of support. So, so both. All right, so I'm glad to see that there are some easy, peaceful on here. More easy than hard, that's excellent. And then we have more hard than easy. And then always hard, wow. I'm glad to see that there's only three, that's good. Glad for you that it's like that. Okay, under stress. So a lot of the loud outbursts, and a lot of both, and we do have some of the shutdown. So when we talk about the window of tolerance a little bit more, we're gonna refer back to that. And the medical challenges, so medical challenges, some ADD, ODD, eczema, coughing at night, digestive, yes. So um, I'll just quickly say that um, if you haven't explored nutrition as a, a piece of the recovery, that's probably something that would be helpful, like, you know, eczema usually directly relates to nutrition according to the naturopath I work with. Okay, there was a little sheet that I put in your packet called family um, and personal life. It's kind of resolutions, but that word is kind of played out. So I put sort of intentions. And I like to have, when I go to a workshop, I want something concrete to happen. I want to make sure that I learn something that I can actually apply. And, and whenever I put down intentions, I really want to think specific, realistic, and actionable. So not a big, like I want us to be happier. I want us to be able to have dinner together without getting in a big fight, or something like that. Okay, so now we get into the nitty gritty here. Building regulation and resilience. The first step is thinking about our nervous systems. So my perspective is all about how our body processes stress. And when we think about it, often it's just in the individual. When I have stress, a sympathetic response comes in and prepares me to fight, flee, or shut down as needed. And after that threat is over, then there's settling that happens, supposedly, right? Um, in somebody who has developmental trauma, the issue is that that process never really got developed in a really clear way on the settling side. So it's like their system literally doesn't know how to come out of the stress response. So they may come down a little bit, but it's never a really regulated, present, engaged kind of place. Okay? So that's what my work is designed to do, is to help the system be able to learn how to regulate itself. So it's different from like when uh, you know the teachers at the school will say, your child needs to self-regulate. What they mean is they need to not 
blurt out the answer. They need to be able to stand in line with the other children. Those kinds of things. Like, they need to regulate their behavior. But that's an external experience. I'm talking about the internal experience of being able to process stress. So when that isn't happening, it's just getting backlogged until it overflows or they shut down or they have a meltdown or, or whatever it is because it's just trickling through. The bandwidth on the filter is just too small. And so our job is to, to teach the system how to work and to expand the bandwidth. Now, we have an individual nervous system and our family is also a nervous system. That's why the best thing that you can do to help your child is to work on your own regulation. Because just like everybody knows with babies, when you hold the baby and you're patting the baby and you're talking in the soothing voice, there's co-regulation. So your, your baby is literally borrowing your regulation to figure out how to do it. And so that same process is happening every day in your family nervous system, right? If you come home from a long day, your partner is there, and it's, let's say you're having a really good day together, and you laugh, and you're cooking dinner, and you do the dishes, and you know, you're having fun together. And then you sit down on the couch, and there's an exchange. You're down-regulating in the presence of another, and your systems are borrowing that from each other. And that helps with the recharge and the reset. And so that's part of what needs to happen with children who have lots of dysregulation from early trauma. Right? But it's just something that we're going to work on a little bit more consciously. So one part of the system changes, and the rest of the system will start to change. So that's even from traditional psychology systems theories, right? <clears throat> The, the main concept that we'll be working with today is called window of tolerance, which is uh, a term that's being used out in the world of, um, of this work. But in Silicon Valley, I really like to call it bandwidth because that's it's something that people understand. It's like more information than I can process is happening. And so when more information comes in, and it spills over, and I start to get more activated than what my system can manage, what's going to happen is I'm going to have management strategies and symptoms. I'm going to get snappy. I'm going to be grumpy. I'm going to be tired. I have to go sleep, right? That's how we, we know that we're outside of the window of tolerance. So what's this magical window of tolerance place like when you're actually in it? Well, first of all, I'm more curious. When I'm stressed out and I've been working too much, I don't really care about anything new. Like, you know, great new concert, new book someone's into, I don't care. I don't want to learn anything. I just want to, like, be in my small little world. Right? Um, you're more creative. You can plan, right? And you can stay present. You might be more willing to do that meditation that you keep putting off, right? Um, it's, it's those kinds of, like, things are easy, you joke more easily. So, part of our job, then, is to recognize when we're in the window of tolerance, ourselves, we start to notice our children, if they're in the window of tolerance, and when we go out, we want to just go, oh, let's see, when I started barking just now, I might be out of window tolerance. Let me step back, not proceed. <laughs> and, you know, that takes a little bit of practice because if you go from zero to 100, it's sort of like you just have to wait until it passes and then go, oh, you know, all right, that was a missed opportunity. Let's see, next time I, I might be able to catch it sooner or I know that those are my triggers, right? <clears throat> so this is the key thing, window of tolerance. Um, we also want to start in building this self-regulation is with the team. And that's, you know, what was happening when they were infants, when they were actually in, you know, in, in a good environment, once they were placed, right? And um, the more that happens, the better they are. So this is all on a spectrum, right? 
if all of you were in the everything could possibly hard category, we would know that maybe the attunement in the beginning was a little rougher. But obviously there was some good attunement happening because there's some ease in the family. Right? So we're gonna work on some ways to keep going with that attunement, like more um, precise attunement things that you can work on with your children. And then continuing to learn how to shape and build regulation in ourselves and in the children. So it's almost always true that when a parent is more calm and regulated, the children are going to be more calm and regulated, which is why that question is so beautiful that the parent asks, like, how can I get more of that for myself, stay calm in the face of that challenge? Well, you're never going to be able to stay calm in the face of a high activation state if you're not able to stay calm when there's less activation. So we got to work there first, build up reserves, and then you know, with practice, you might be able to manage it more often. It's also a lot about self-forgiveness because, I mean, nobody can do it all the time. We just do it as often as we can. When it doesn't go the right way, we make our repair, right? And we move on. We keep going in that direction. And temporary shifts lead to long-term change. And what I mean by that is that when I'm working with a family to specifically heal this uh, ability to self-regulate, I'm often having them reduce <coughs> stimulus, reduce exposure to activation in ways that the public or other family members or other people might see as like, well, you can't live like that forever. Eventually you gotta blah, 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 right? There's always this like wisdom that will come out that you're like, <laughs> like, that, that's, like the most upset I get when clients come in is when they tell me what other professionals or other experts are telling them. <laughs> then like my activation goes straight through the roof. <laughs> Because I know how harmful it is and how people are made wrong and need to feel bad and not getting help and struggling and struggling for so many years. <clears throat> so, our famous window tolerance. Okay, so we have different signs of what the window of tolerance, like how we're going to find this, this unicorn experience called the window of tolerance in ourselves and in our children. And so we have like the body signs, somatic signs. And in that place, we're actually more self-regulating. So that means whatever stress came in, my body handled it. I didn't really have to do anything with it. I didn't have to manage it or take deep breaths or tell somebody about it. It just came and went and it was fine. And so that's why in the beginning, if our bandwidth or our window of tolerance is very narrow, that doesn't happen very often. It's like every little thing, it's like, oh God, I've got to like, how am I going to deal with this, right? Um, and so over time, when you stretch that out, it's like, well, I mean, for me, I was raised, I was born a very sensitive person. And when I started healing my nervous system, sometimes it gets more sensitive before it like settles down. And so, like, for me, going to Target was, <laughs> like, the hardest thing I could do. And I would, like, I would have to go in and put, like, earplugs in, and I'd have to know exactly where the thing I wanted was and go only between, like, you know, 9 and 10 p.m. or whatever, like, right before closing, and, and, and just try to manage it, right? And then so, um, because it becomes this whole physical experience as well as, like, an emotional one. And it's, it's, you know, parts of the brain are getting enacted that the frontal cortex can't out-explain. It's like, well, you're just going to target. You know, of course, my brain could say that. I can logically say, you know, nothing bad is happening to me. I'm just in target. But it doesn't matter because my body is having a fight or flight response. And instead of fighting against it or making it wrong, you know, during that healing phase, I was like, I'm going to do everything I can to not overload my nervous system unnecessarily. Right? I can go and do other things, you know, where I'll stretch that and maybe exceed it a bit and then have to recover. 
but going to Target, like, eh, right? And so then over time, with taking care of myself and letting my nervous system recover and grow, then I now I can go to Target whenever I want, and there's no earplugs involved, right? And I think that if, if you have children who are sensitive to sensory stimulus and you're not, that's also hard. So speaking as an adult who has it, I think is, you know, because I can express it, but it is sometimes physical pain, you know, when, uh, when sensory input is too much. So hopefully that's helpful. <clears throat> so yeah, the somatic signs. During that phase, self-repair is happening, so actually healing is taking place. There's more ease, you feel more grounded and settled. Pain symptoms will be less when you're in the window of tolerance, if you have chronic pain. Um, mental and emotional signs. So you'll be more calm, more curious, playful, relaxed, relational. And then um, behavioral signs. So you're going to be more cooperative. If you're in fight and flight, no. Right? Um, completion of tasks. So you're maybe less likely to procrastinate as much. <laughs> Uh, more spontaneous. Empathy is more available. And creativity. Okay. And so here's the opposite. is when we're outside of the window of tolerance. And we have the, like when it goes out, the top side of it where it says step and over activation is more of the external sorts of outbursts and angry and grumpy, and it's a spectrum, right? It can be from, like, ah, rage to just, like, I feel a little bit irritated. And it can be, you know, I'm feeling a little restless, I'm a little bit anxious, or I'm having a panic attack. Right, so, but it's on that top side of things, which is more of the fight and flight responses. When there's too much energy flowing through a system, the fuse will break. And we go down into the dorsal side, which is the, more the freeze side. The dorsal is um, from the polyvagal theory, which I touched upon in my last talk here. If you don't know that, don't worry. Um, so that's more on the collapse and withdrawal side. So oftentimes, people will do both when they've had developmental trauma. It'll flip back and forth. So even thinking about your own experiences, when you get really, really anxious, or then when you drop into depression, or um, when you have no energy, you just can't get out of bed, your system has gone dorsal, it's kind of a conservation state, so that uh, your system's like, there's so much energy here, the best thing that we could do is just to slow down, get a little bit spacey. Oftentimes it's got a kind of a sedative quality where it feels kind of pleasant. I feel great zoning out. Why would I come out? Let me just lose myself into this iPad for 10 hours <laughs> or 15, right? <laughs> so I, didn't, I didn't get any of those questions, which is kind of surprising. Okay, so, um, so those are the sorts of signs that are happening in those different states. And I really want this to, to land for you. So we're going to, um, in a moment, start to think about you and your child and how you can recognize these different states. And uh, we're going to go over one more chart first and then I'll, I'll uh, explain what to do next. And my mentor Steve Terrell is um, really a big fan of Bruce Perry who wrote uh, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog and his work is called Neurosequential Development. So I haven't studied his work directly, but through Steve, I've been getting it for the last four years to some degree. So it's it's kind of interesting because if you just find a spot on the chart, that, like a, a word that pops out at you, like hmm, defiance, tantrums. Oh, that's interesting. My child does that, and then you you um, you maybe look down and and uh, you know it's it's a very fear based state. And, you know, when it's not an outward, top of the chart experience, the opposite is going to be dissociation. 
and withdraw. And so you look at the top number there, one to three is the age. So when a child is in that like really heavily defiant, they're really developmentally about age one to three. And if you think about how you would respond to a one-year-old who is screaming at you, what I like to do is sort of put my goggles on and be like, okay, I'm dealing with a one-year-old now. I'm not going to use a lot of complicated explanations. The fewer words, the better, okay? Um, imagine them. It's like, all right, this is a one-year-old person who's just screaming and yelling. I'm going to filter out some of the content, especially the stuff that could be hurtful to me. It's like, all right, this is just them, very overactivated. I'm just going to try to keep myself calm, be with them, not say so many words, and try to hold space for them until they come back into an older age, maybe their more current age, where the prefrontal cortex is again available. Because in that state, it's not available. If you look at, um, on the left-hand side, about um, from third from the bottom, it says cognitive aptitude. So if you have an adult, and they're in that state, they've now lost 40 IQ points. So you're not dealing with the same relational, smart, you know, reasonable person when they're in that state. So it's not worth having a teachable moment, right? I mean, to some degree, but it's got to be brain appropriate. Does that make sense? So um, if your child's behaviors are very all over the place, this is going to come in very handy, just to remember that, and that you want to be doing any kind of teaching or connecting, explaining, once they come out of that state. And the hardest thing that I find for parents is when one parent is on board and the other isn't, because somebody has values that they you know, you really have to do this, this, and this, otherwise they're never going to learn. Like, they're definitely not going to learn an eight-year-old lesson if they're in a one-year-old state of mind. That's uh, news you can use to take home. Yes. So, so the terror, the mental and internal state of the infant is a state of terror. If there's trauma. If there's trauma. Or if there's intense, like a separation. So if there's a separation from a caregiver, I'm going to die. I can't take care of myself. I can't get food, I can't get any of my needs met. It immediately goes to, I'm going to die. Right? So, in a, in a healthy, attached child, it'll start out as like, uh, you know, like, come. And they'll be flirting with you and making all the googly eye contact and that to say, we need to bond because I need you to take care of me. Right? And, and so then, when they're small, breaks in that, they can handle a little bit of misattunement or, you know, I was crying because I was hungry and you're changing my diaper, what's up with that, right? They can handle that and they'll recover and it's fine. They're not going to be ruined for life, right? But when there's repeated, prolonged attachment disruptions, like in the case of ones who are left alone for long periods of time in different environments, things like that, that's when it goes to terror. Right? And it's, it's very hard because the shame cloud can just come right over the whole group and be like, oh no, and there was that one time when I let him cry it out, and now that must be why it's completely ruined. So see if you can let all of that go aside, because this information is so new, nobody knew, and even doctors today there are still people out there being like, you have to sleep train because they need to get on a schedule and, and things like that, okay? <clears throat> so as much as you can, just for your own heart, to try to set aside any of the blame and any of the hurt around that because you're doing the best you can, okay? Yes? It seems like 
the stuff that kids have to deal with every day, school, homework, produces a lot of this. And so I feel like at home, I can either keep trying to play therapist to calm him down, but the reality is what seems to set him off is the very homework that I'm trying to get him to do. Okay, this is a really good question. And, and I know it's on the minds of a lot of people because it's true. Like, how do you navigate the school's expectations, your own hopes and desires for your child with what they can manage? And if they have a tiny bandwidth for this stuff, their day-to-day -day life, it's just pouring more into their system than they can possibly process. So you have options. One is to keep pushing them through and to hope that they can get the homework done if you, like, lead them really strongly. And that's what a lot of people do, and that's definitely your choice. And I will tell you that what Steve Terrell tells me all the time is, oh, that person actually finished the week because, wow, usually these kids don't really get there until later in their 20s. I know that's going to sound like bad news. <laughs> but the good news is that eventually it can shift unless they get treatment and, or, you know, doing some of this work to help expand their bandwidth. And again, because coming back to that question, well, I didn't get them to comply with the treatments. So the best you can do is start with yourself and the co-regulation and the behavior shifts that a lot of people in here that I've spoken with are already doing. Like, all right, well, we're not going to take them there because that's going to be too much for them. And, you know, you're already doing a lot of that to help manage their activation. But, um, but continuing along this course with some of the refinements that, that I'll be telling you about today. Someone asked about um, drugs at birth, yes. not only um, like if the mother was on drugs, but if, you know, when children are induced, or when parents are, or mothers are induced. Um, I read a study about Pitocin that actually, uh, after five, children who are five years old, um, if the mother had taken Pitocin, they were much more likely to have emotion regulation difficulties. Um, and sometimes Pitocin has to happen if it's an emergency, but sometimes it was going to out of convenience and things like that. It's like, Argh. So let me uh, continue on here. So let's get really personal so that you can figure out how to recognize states. Your state, your child's state, your partner's state, your teacher, your child's teacher's state. Everybody has a state, right? So first of all is the basic. Are they in or out of the window of tolerance? And it's not always easy to spot, but there are going to be some really obvious signs, like if they're dismissive or, you know, if you're um, impatient or, you know, oh, okay, this is how I can tell. And then once you know if they're out of the window of tolerance, are they more on the fight and flight side, the more feisty, or are they kind of collapse like, I just can't deal with you right now, kind of thing, right? Um, how activated are they? Are they just barely out of the window of tolerance, or are they sky high through the roof? Because all of these things are eventually going to lead you to, to the right prevention in the moment. It's like, wow, they're through the roof. We're going to stop everything and just let this activation come down some. I mean, the thing is, I have this, this wonderful homemade little snow globe here, and, and it represents like the activation that we all have. And the problem is, this thing is sitting shaken up all day long, and it never gets to settle. It never settles all the way. It'll start to fall, and then, lo and behold, it's getting shaken up again. So at the very least, if you have no other ideas, at least time will eventually help it settle, at least to the degree that they're capable of or that you're capable of. And again, that's not always going to be possible. If you're a parent, and you're like, well, I'm sorry, but my glitter is still falling. Can you please come and ask me that question in about an hour? <laughs> I mean, that's just not realistic. But at least, you know, when you have control over the schedule or what's going on, all right, let's just take some time and see if things look different in about 10 minutes after things have gotten a little less 
energize. Are symptoms and coping or management strategies being used in a moment? So we haven't talked about this as much, but um, symptoms are going to be like, oh, I got a stomach ache, or my jaw got tight, I got a headache, those kinds of uh, physical things. Um, management strategies can be anything from the more adaptive side of things, like, you know, okay, I, I remembered that thing my therapist said and I used it. Um, I got chocolate. <laughs> I decided to disappear for a little while into my room and, and get a candy bar, <laughs> and then I felt better, and then I could re-engage. You know, those things aren't hurting anybody. It's like, great, fine. And then to the less adaptive side where, you know, my coping strategy is, is alcohol, or I get abused it, right? So on the, the less adaptive side, those are the things that we want to say, all right, we need to shift out of that natural strategy into a different one. And what's a more adaptive one that I can use so that I can maintain in order to be with my children in a way that they need to help their activation? Okay, so that's going to be the next piece, is we're going to have new um, sheets come up. And what I'd like to do is have you work in the group that you're in at your table. And we actually just have four... Um, four sheets that we're going to be working with. So you can start your um, your list at your table, and then you can just have one person go up and be the, the, the writer. And so uh, what we're looking for is the, the signs of how I know I'm in the window of tolerance, the signs I know when I'm out of it, and um, it's specific to you. And then we'll all come up with this list, and then you're going to have ideas, like, oh, why didn't you think of that? I'm doing that too. Right? Or, oh, my child does that. Okay, so it's going to be very handy and practical for you to find this. So let me put these up and then we'll, we'll move into that. <laughs>